Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen and uh, young people, we've got a most important task ahead of us this evening uh, because we are, are going to diagnose the sickness of a patient. And the patient is none other uh, than planet Earth. And not only planet Earth, uh, we're going to diagnose the sickness of the whole Earth and all life uh, that's on it as well. That's what we're going to do. And we're not only going to diagnose a sickness, we're also, uh, together, going to find a cure. Uh, and so the first half is looking at the sickness, really, and the second half is really having a look to find the cure. And we are going to find a cure, and the cure is going to be uh, found in this book here, uh, the Bible. Because this is the only uh, supernatural book on the planet... And it is the only book that declares to be the word of the living God in heaven. And he tells us about the planet that he's made, and he tells us about the cure for the sickness uh, that is enveloping it. So, we will find a cure, and you might say, well, are we qualified to diagnose the sickness and find the cure? Well, actually we are. Because anybody is qualified to diagnose it as long as you've got an open heart and mind to pick this up and to read God's plan and purpose as detailed out here. So that's what, we, that's what we're going to do. This talk has been uh, growing on my mind for some little time now and it came to a conclusion uh, about a month ago when that uh, dropped through my letterbox because uh, I order Time magazine, it comes through weekly and, th and that arrived on April the 3rd just this year and as you can see what the front cover says there it says be worried, be very worried and it's talking as you can see uh, there by that poor polar bear that's about to fall into the water about the state of the physical world in which we live that's what it was talking about. Eight pages inside dedicated to this. And it began with sort of a little passage which seemed to me to sum it all up in just a few words. The writer sort of begins, No one can say exactly what it looks like when a planet takes ill, but it probably looks a lot like Earth. Never mind what you've heard about global warming as a slow motion emergency that would take decades to play out, Suddenly and unexpectedly, the crisis is upon us. That's how it began and then went into huge detail as to the problems that are facing the physical world in which we live. And it described it as an illness, as a sickness. Um, then sort of ferreting about a bit, I found in fact there's a lot going on in the media at this time. It's not just Time magazine picking this up. Uh, the BBC uh, have got uh, a new series underway called Planet Under Pressure. Uh, ITV uh, have got Three Degrees from Disaster uh, running as well at the moment because suddenly people are seeing uh, terrible things happening before their eyes and things escalating in the physical world in which we live. Now, this is all very odd really, isn't it? Because there we are, God's view, if you like, of the earth from, from space as he, as he looks down upon it, and it is a beautiful world. And, and in fact, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, uh, we read that, of course, God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth. And it goes on and says in verse 31 of the very first chapter that God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. He did not say, well, some of it was okay, but there was a bit over there that wasn't so good. I didn't like that bit, but this bit, he didn't. I'm not being facetious, he didn't. He, the whole thing that he made was very good. And for God to say it was very good, it must have been very good. He is a perfect being. No shadow of turning with the Lord God. He says it's very good. He means what he says. It was very, very good. So why is it that we're reading reports like Time magazine that says if we're going to look at a sick earth, we're probably looking at it right now? Because that doesn't sound very good uh, to me. 
So what is wrong with uh, planet Earth? And this is where you're going to help me out here. Because what I want you to do is to sort of yell out to me in a nice sort of fashion um, areas that you think, from a physical point of view, things are going wrong uh, in the world. And if you get get the answer right, it will mean I can uncover one of those pictures. So the six we've got to uncover here. So uh, off you go. What did you say? Katrina. Well, let's talk then in slightly wider terms, and we will say storms and hurricanes. Are you, are you happy with that? Right, well, that's good. We got the first one. We have storms and hurricanes, right? Um, earthquakes. Earthquakes. We have earthquakes coming up. There are earthquakes. They're not very good, are they? We're going to look at all these in more detail in, in, in just a minute. Yes, Paul? Drought. Drought. Can you see the pictures? Oh, yes, you can, can't you? Yeah. I did wonder about hiding them more than I have done, but there we are. We'd have been here all night probably. But yeah, there we are. We have drought. Starvation. Um, well, that will come under drought. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jamie. Um, tsunami will bring that under both earthquake um, and a little bit of storm maybe with floods and whatever. Global warming. Global warming. Thank you, Walter. We'll have global warming. And there are some uh, polar bears upon the ice looking warm. Um, There's a tree hidden under the bottom right, so you've got deforestation. Well, okay. Yeah, okay. Oh. <laughs> far is fire. Now, the thing is, we don't think about fire as being a problem because in this country we don't have fire. But you wait till you see some of the things that are happening on the earth right now from a fire uh, point of view. And, and the final one... Pandemic disease. Pandemic disease, no. Um, <laughs> uh, but I suppose it might cause a pandemic disease because I've put pollution there. Now, I know we're causing it, but of course that's f- uh, affecting the physical world in, in which we live. So we're going to have a look at some of these things. And, and really, it's not exhaustive. I'm not saying that at all. There's, there's many things that we could put up that are going wrong uh, with the Earth. These were some of the things that Time magazine itself focused in upon as being problems for the earth. So what we're going to do now, uh, well you, you tell me, which one do you want to have a look at first? I mean, if you don't want to look at any, I suppose we'll go home, but um, let's assume that we do. Storm, let's... Let's be brave and start with the first one then. Right, so we have storm and hurricane. Okay, well what do we read about that? We've already mentioned Katrina. Hurricanes, uh, said the Times on the 15th of September last year, of the intensity of Katrina have become almost twice as common over the last 35 years, according to research, suggesting that global warming could be worsening uh, severe storms. And uh, there was this graph. On each one of these, we're going to put a bit of text and put a graph and we'll have a look at some pictures. But, but there we are. We see from 1974, uh, the severity of the storms upon the earth are increasing uh, dramatically. And the number of these severe storms are increasing on the earth. This is not very good, is it? It causes great, great destruction. Uh, And and just some uh, pictures here. Northern Europe shaken by storms. The worst storm to hit Europe in the last 40 years hit Europe last January. Um, That is about two miles from where I grew up um, in Birmingham where a tornado uh, blasted through there. And of course there's the scenes of uh, Katrina. And we could put up masses of pictures but here is storm and here it is doing its, its damage. And it's getting increasingly worse. So what what do you want to go for next? Fire. We have, uh, well I heard fire I think. Let's have a look at fire then. Let's go for fire. Fires are increasingly uh, damaging the world's forests, destroying millions of hectares of valuable timber uh, and and so on. This is the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations doing now special reports uh, on fire. 
Um, this actually is a graph showing you the number of forest fires and how they've actually increased in southern member states of Europe. Fire is becoming an increasing problem as the world is getting uh, less rainfall and not only that but people soaking up the water by drinking it and whatever with more of us on the earth. It's actually creating fires in places where they never used to happen. And there's just the most incredible uh, pictures when you go on the internet and, and look at fire of the immense damage that's being caused. This forest here a massive forest uh, being destroyed by fire for the first time that people can remember it is not something that would normally happen in that particular forest. This down here is showing you where the fires raged over one year. This is in 2004 and they tracked where all the fires were. And you see, we're, we're okay here. We, fire we don't think about as being a problem. But you live round here, you live down here, or you live over here, then you would certainly know that fire is a major problem, destroying masses and masses of, uh, of, of natural life, uh, plants and vegetation. And of course, at the same time, chucking gigantic, amount, uh, gigantic amounts of pollution uh, into the atmosphere as, as well. So that does not, to me, look uh, very good at all. Um, what, what, what was next? We had uh, global warming, I think somebody said, so we'll have a, a little look at that. So here we are with uh, global warming. The existence of natural greenhouse effect is established beyond doubt. This is the World Resources Institute saying this. Uh, the temperature of the earth is increasing. 1998 was the hottest on, was not just on record, but they, they think for at least a thousand years. Sea levels are rising. They've increased four to ten inches, they say, over the past 100 years. And, and there is a graph uh, showing you from 1880 up to almost the present day of the uh, sea level change and how it's increased and at the same time over a similar period of time how global average temperatures are going up and up creating uh, global warming and creating uh, this sort of thing this was the uh, polar ice cap in 1979 that red line was the border of the polar ice cap you can see that 20% of it has now melted since 1979. And Time magazine actually said their whole uh, thesis, if you like, was that the world is now at tipping point. It's reached the point that when you go up to the top of the hill, you just suddenly race down the other side and it escalates much, much quicker than you actually think. And we're at that point now. This map was in the Telegraph showing what they believe, if the sea level rises at the minimum expected level, that area of central London would actually be completely underwater. The whole current centre of the city of London would be underwater uh, within the next sort of uh, 50 years, 25 to 50 years they reckon. That is doomsday scenario, that is if the sea rose about 7 metres, which it is possible to do. And you can see, actually, how much of the UK is left if that actually did happen. Here's some interesting pictures. This is like a before and after. So this picture was taken in 1859, and you can see this huge glacier coming down the slopes here. Now it's gone. Here was a gigantic glacier um, in 1928. Now it's just completely gone. It's way, way back up here. So the world is heating up, creating uh, problems of rising uh, sea level. What haven't we had? Uh, what about pollution? We'll have a look at pollution. The World Health Organization says that 3 million people are killed, killed worldwide by outdoor air pollution every single year. 
uh, and that is from vehicle and industrial emissions. They go on and talk about pollution of water, they go on and talk about pollution of soil, and so on. Using the pesticides that we use nowadays, uh, it creates a huge amount of disease itself. Um, an estimated one in four people worldwide are exposed to unhealthy concentrations of air pollution, they say. And, and just one graph to show you what's happening here, the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, uh, again from 1870 uh, to roughly today, uh, has increased dramatically, creating, uh, or obviously this is one of the huge pollutants that's being pumped into the uh, atmosphere of which we breathe, creating all of these uh, problems as well. Um, and of course, we do our absolute best, do we not, as a, as, as a people, upon, as a race upon this earth, to pollute. These pictures, that one was taken from the war in Iraq. War causes terrible amounts of pollution, especially when somebody like Saddam Hussein decides to blow up all the oil fields he can get his hands on. Absolutely astounding levels of pollution. Some of it we don't mean to create. That poor bird there swimming in oil is because of a tanker that was ripped open and casting millions of uh, gallons of uh, oil into the sea. Um, and, and there are many places in the world where riding about with a mask on is what you just have to do to live and to breathe. Uh, this is not very good. Uh, we've got dead zones in America, we've got pesticides in Africa, we've got river pollution here, we've got oil spills, we've got Chernobyl over here, we've got uh, dioxins here, we've got air pollution here. It's not good. It is not good, and that is the world in which we live. Uh, and um, we, we, we then look at drought. We haven't looked at drought, have we? No. An estimated third of the world's population currently lives in water-stressed countries. It's set to increase to two-thirds within 25 years. Um, and the, the big problem here isn't so much the, uh, the, the lack of, or the change in the, the amount of rain that's falling, it's the amount that people are using, especially uh, in the West. Uh, the world's population has tripled in the last 100 years, but water usage has increased sixfold. And the problem is there is a limited amount of water that you can drink on the earth. This uh, graph over here shows you the, how the population has increased since 1750 and you can just see that it was three quarters of a billion back here and we are racing towards seven billion now. And it is escalating away. The world can't cope with this. It cannot cope with more and more and more people because of this factor here. There is only so much fresh water. The world only produces so much fresh water. And out of all the water in the world, 97.5% of it is undrinkable because it's seawater. Only 2.5% of it is, is in fresh water. And when you take out the glaciers and the underground water that you can't actually get rid of, uh, or, or get to, you're down to a tiny, tiny little percentage that you can actually drink. It's an incredible thing. And, and that is what uh, is happening. And so, we see these terrible pictures of, and we know even in this country at this moment, there's uh, a great crisis in the southeast because there is not enough water and hose pipe bans, but they reckon stand pipes might have to be uh, bought out and all the rest of it. This catapults then into this situation of hot spots for the world from a um, ha not having enough water leads directly to not having enough crops to grow and, and leads to uh, poor uh, animals dying and, and obviously eventually people dying in their thousands and even millions uh, in, in Africa. This is not very good. And so, finally, we'll have a look at um, earthquakes. I think this is the last one. Uh, 
major earthquakes. The World Almanac tells us that there were only 21 earthquakes of major strength between the years 1000 and 1800. But between 1800 and 1900 there were 18 major earthquakes. In the next 50 years, between 1900 and 1950, there were 33 major earthquakes. And between 1950 and 1991, there were 93 major earthquakes, almost tripling the number of the previous half century, claiming the lives of more than 1.3 million people. And and it's not just these major earthquakes, it's just the whole number of them is on the increase. So this is going back to 1880, and you see now the huge increase in the number of earthquakes that we are seeing uh, in the world, just the vast number. So we've got the strength going up, and we've also got just the sheer number of them going up as well. And that, of course, in in most recent times, uh, caused, and and I've just picked on the biggest earthquake, which of course created the tsunami uh, at the back end of 2004, uh, when on Boxing Day, this massive earthquake that hit the world, uh, the biggest in, in many, many, many years, caused the tsunami that, of course, killed over a quarter of a million people in, in one go. Um, this is not very good. And so you see, it's, it's all going wrong. It is going wrong. Time magazine is absolutely right. And of course, it's not just the earth that, it's, that, that is sick. The people that are living on the earth are sick. We've got this global spread of, of HIV affecting millions of people. We've got bird flu now that is uh, a great concern and how that uh, might well be spreading. We've got the foot and mouth that we saw in this country where animals are having to be burned all over the place because of a disease that they picked up. Heart rates, uh, British heart disease rates are extremely high at this time. Uh, we've got how do we stop malaria? We could put all millions of diseases up, couldn't we? We could spend all night doing that. So all we're saying is it's not just the physical world that's very sick. The people, the animals, the whole lot of it is sick. It's all sick. Now, the Bible actually does tell us that all these things were going to happen. In Luke 21 it says that there would be great earthquakes in lots of different places and there would be famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs from heaven and surely these words are true. God knew that these things were going to happen but that doesn't really help us, does it? Because we go back to this and say, well, why... If if it all started very good, did it go so very wrong? Why did God let that happen? If he's he's in control, why let that happen? And and also, we could say, well, when did it go wrong? Started off well, we're in a right mess now. When did it all go wrong? Well, I wonder if you'd turn with me to uh, Genesis We'll look at a few verses here. Because, unfortunately, it went wrong very, very quickly. It went wrong right back in the Garden of of Eden. And James kindly read for us uh, chapter 3. If you you just turn back to chapter 2. The Lord God, in verse 16, commanded man commanded the man, who is obviously Adam, saying this, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Everyone you can eat from, says God, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So God said, you can eat anything, but not that one tree. You can't have that one. And if you do, you'll die. Well, we know what happened, because 
being deceived, the woman took of the fruit and ate it and passed it to her husband and he said, Adam said, yes, well I'll have a bite of it as well and they both ate of the fruit. And so it was that they disobeyed God. This was the first sin, if you like, in, in the world. It was the first sin. The first sin was not killing somebody, wasn't raping somebody. The first sin was purely picking a piece of fruit and eating a piece of fruit. But because God had said don't do it, that was disobedience and that was sin. And so God, in chapter 3, tells uh, Adam and Eve exactly what was going to happen. And we're just going to look for tonight at what he said to Adam. And in verse 17 of chapter 3, we read, Lord God talking, He said unto Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, And as the eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall you eat bread, until you return into the ground. For out of it thou wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return." So you see, the Lord God's ever so clear, and he's not breaking the promise. He's said quite logically, if you eat this, then this is the consequence. And and so here we have detailed out for us here. He says, because you've eaten of the tree, cursed is the ground. The physical world on which you now live, Adam, is now from here on in, cursed. That's what he says, isn't it? And we're told it would bring forth thorns and thistles. It didn't bring forth thorns and thistles before. This was now something new, a curse that came upon the earth. And on top of that, not only the earth is going to be cursed, but actually your, your, your own body itself is going to begin decaying and eventually, Adam, you will die. Why? Because he bit a piece of fruit. What's wrong with that? He sinned. He did not do what God asked him to do. And God specifically told him not to eat. He did. It's sin. Those were the consequences. And that is when it went wrong. And so it was that they were banished from the garden. And the curse began. And he began dying. And the world, the physical world itself, was cursed. And so, as we read, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so, you see, what I'm trying to uh, explain is, is this, that man's sin, I want you to think of that almost like a spiritual sickness. Not a physical sickness, like I've got the flu or something. This is a, a, a sickness inside. What actually makes you tick? When you do things that God does not want you to do, I want you to think of that as spiritual sickness. And Adam and Eve, but we're just thinking of Adam here, became spiritually sick. And that led to a physical sickness, pain and sorrow and eventually death. But at the very same time, the earth was cursed and became physically sick itself and brought forth thorns and thistles, and and actually changed the world from this beautiful place that God originally made into a cursed world, a sick world, a physically sick world, with the sort of things that we've been looking at. It wasn't just thorns and thistles that the world was going to bring forth, it was all manner of problems from here on in. Down here, I don't know whether you can read it, in Romans 5 verse 12, just to show you that this still continues to today, we read that so death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And in fact, we read about the actual physical world as well in Romans chapter 8. That the whole creation groans and travaileth in pain together until now. So there we have Paul writing to the Romans saying actually the physical world itself, the whole of creation is groaning and in pain until now. Until now. And every person is sinning until now. And so this terrible 
terrible cycle of sickness of both man and earth has continued from that day. Well, that's all sort of depressing. And I'm just about to get it more depressing, I've remembered, because we've looked at the physical uh, sickness of the physical earth and the, and, the, and, the, and the physical sickness of people, but we haven't really looked at man's spiritual sickness in any great detail, so we just have a quick look at that. So we're now talking about what people do. Is it right or is it wrong? Well, we read in, on the BBC there that violent crime is on the up uh, in this country. That is spiritual sickness. Stabbing people, hitting people is spiritual sickness. It is not doing what God wants us to do. Creationism has no place in schools. Actually being, actually being able to teach our children about the truth of the Bible is now outlawed uh, in this country. In, in many, many places. Global corruption is on the rise. So just as we've seen that all the physical things in the world are on the rise, so are all the spiritual sicknesses of the world on the rise. Gay marriages over the 3,000 mark. Uh, we talked about that this morning. Uh, immorality is rife uh, in, in the world. Binge drinking, out of control. There's a, a picture of our city centre streets in the daytime with young people uh, drinking to excess. But the one thing I want you to remember is this, that we can look upon sin as the terrible things. The, the, the really terrible things of people being killed and uh, rape and, and homosexuality and all those sort of things. And there's a great danger that we say, well actually, that doesn't involve, I'm not spiritually sick, I don't sin, but I have to tell you uh, that we do. <laughs> you see? Um, we do, that's me and Monte Carlo, I mean, I, I, you know, I shouldn't have been there probably, but there we are. So we do, we do sin. And we have to realise that. We do have to realise that, that each one of us is spiritually sick. Because whether we eat a piece of fruit that's wrong, or whether we kill somebody, it's wrong. It is sin. And that was foretold in the Bible as well, as uh, being these terrible times in the last days. Terrible times when people be lovers of their own selves and covetous and boasters and proud and blasphemers and disobedient and unthankful and unholy and without natural affection, men living with men, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those as a good and so on and so on. This is the world, the spiritually sick world in which we live. And sometimes you see these two things coming together. So here we've got, uh, and, and coming together very, very clearly. So here we have New Orleans, where people drink and eat too much and stay up late and behave badly. It's famous for its gamblers, its prostitutes, its exhibitionists, its antichrists, its alcoholics, its sodomites, its drug addicts, its fetishists, its onanists, its pornographers, its frauds, its jades, its litterbugs and its lesbians. This is what this place was renowned for. And is it... Uh, perhaps any wonder that the physical sickness that came upon that place was so great. God's hand is behind these things. So what is the solution to all of this um, problem? Well, if we put it in order, this is, I think, how it went. That man became spiritually sick and sinned which led to his own physical sickness and eventually death, which led to the earth being cursed and becoming sick itself, um, bringing forth all the terrible things that we've been looking at. So what is the solution to all of that? How do we get it right? How do we remove the disease from the earth? What we have to do is start at the top. You have to remove the sin. There's no other way around it. If sin was a thing that caused the sickness, you've got to get rid of the sin. And that is what this book is all about. How to get rid of your sin.
Now, um, Angel Gabriel came to uh, Mary and Joseph, and that is a picture of, uh, it was a picture of Mary, but I've had to superimpose somebody that looked like Joseph over it, um, because this is what the Angel Gabriel said to Joseph. And there were two things. He went to Joseph and spoke to Joseph, and then he went to Mary and spoke to Mary. And this is what he said to Joseph. He said this to a man. He said that Mary was going to bring forth a son and call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So there we are. Suddenly the Bible says, here is how you can be saved from your sin. Well, surely that's something that every one of us should be uh, desperate to find out about. How uh, can my sins uh, be saved by this man? In fact, the word, the name Jesus, as we probably all know, means saviour. He came to save us from our sins. And in fact, when he was on earth, quite often he said this type of thing. Uh, When he saw the faith of this particular person who was sick, he actually said, thy sins be forgiven thee. He forgave him his sins. Now, how does that work then? How does Jesus uh, actually help us to get our sins forgiven? How does all that work? Well, we read in Romans 5 that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We read that Christ died for our sins. In Corinthians, we read that Jesus appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself in Hebrews. Now, that's all quite complicated, because how does somebody dying over here many thousands of years ago help me, Andy Walton, to get rid of my sin here in 2006? How does it work? Well, I'm going to have a go at explaining it, and it isn't actually that easy, but I'm going to try and explain it like this. I want you to imagine that this seesaw here is a balance, and it has to remain level. It has to remain level. And on this side is our life. And on that side is God's response. Okay? So our life, what we do is on this side. God's response is on that side. But it has to balance. It has to balance. So what do we do in our life? How does God view our life? Well, we've already quoted it, that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what we're going to do is on this side, we're going to put the weight of sin. And it's actually described as a weight in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that besets us. So now we're going to put sin onto uh, this balance here. And of course, what's going to happen now is that the whole thing uh, tilts down like this and the balance is broken. So God has to respond with something because he has to keep the balance Uh, level. So this is a negative thing, it's a weight that's pushed it down. So what does God balance it with? Well he balances it with something else that goes down, for we go down into the grave. And he says that the wages of sin is death. And so on this side he puts us going down into the earth and we die. That's what happens. That's what happened with uh, Adam and that's happened with every other person since then because death has passed upon all men for all have sinned, says Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Okay, that's us. That's easy to understand perhaps. But what about Jesus' life? What happens with Jesus? Well, Jesus did no sin and neither guile was found in, in his mouth. He said nothing ever wrong. Never once did he say anything wrong in 1 Peter 2, verse 22. And we know that the Holy Spirit descended upon uh, Jesus in a bodily shape like a dove when he was baptised and God said he was pleased with him. So as a symbol for what Jesus did, I'm going to, instead of using the weight of sin, I'm going to use a dove here. So Jesus, in his life, when God looked at it, did no sin. And yet what did he get for doing that? He was crucified. So this actually went the wrong way. Didn't it? Because that does, no, that does not balance up. He did no sin and yet he died. And it was God's response. It was God's response. We actually read that it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. Uh, he hath put him to grief. 
And in fact, Jesus himself accepted that and said that Christ has so loved us and has given himself for us as an offering and uh, a sacrifice to God. So you see, Jesus actually died because God wanted him to die. But the balance is broken. You can't have that, can you? And so what has God got to do to restore the balance? He has to raise him up. This side has got to be raised up. And that is exactly what had to happen. There was no question about it. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 2 that God has raised up Jesus, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. It was impossible, because God has to keep this balance. And so the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, so bringing the balance back again. And he will never die again. Now, there we have our situation. There we have Jesus' situation. The question is, how do we get from there to there? We've got to get to a situation of no sin. That's what we've got to do. How do we do it? And God has found an incredible way, designed I should say, an incredible way of getting from there to there. The first thing that we have to do is acknowledge that we're sinful. That's the first step. If you don't go there, then you may as well say, well, I'm not ill, and, and we go nowhere. You have to acknowledge that to start with. The second thing is that we must repent. We must realise we've got to do something about it. We must then accept that the only solution to our sin is this one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. We must then be baptised, which we'll look at in just one second. We must then continue to acknowledge that we're sinful. We must then continue to repent. And we must then continue to accept that the Lord Jesus is our Saviour and remember him as often as we can. And we keep repeating that from number five continually for the rest of our lives. That's what we do. So what's this bit here about being baptised? Because, OK, I might acknowledge those three, but that's something I've physically got to do. What is baptism? How does that work? But it's the key to it all. You see, baptism means to be fully submerged under water. That's what it means. And we read uh, in uh, uh, Romans... That know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into uh, death. So you see, when we... Uh, that's the best way I can get of lying down. But when, when you uh, are baptised, you go under the water. And you're baptised into Jesus Christ's death. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death says Romans, and then we don't stay under water very long, we come uh, up very quickly, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And so you see what happens is, we symbolically die, and are symbolically raised uh, with the Lord Jesus, and we've been baptised into his death. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ, have put on Christ. God now symbolically has clothed us, in the Lord's death and resurrection. That's what he's done. So you see, on the night when I was baptised, I approached the waters of baptism. In this situation, I was sin, doing lots of sin, and there would have been God's response. But on the night I was baptised, uh, this happened. God replaced that with the death and the resurrection of the Lord he, Lord Jesus. He clothed me in the Lord Jesus. He gave me those two things into my own personal balance. But now, of course, it's gone wonky again because I've got sin and yet the God has given me uh, the sacrifice and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And so the only way to solve it is to remove my sin. And so, the balance is restored. 
Which is why, when you are baptised, you wash away your sins. That is what happens. It could be no other way. It's the grace of God to give us this. He doesn't have to. But the fact that he gives us this means that he gives us this. And so you see, for us to get from here to here is through belief and baptism. That is the only way for us to move from the one and to the other. You might say, well, after I'm baptised, well, I could keep doing lots of sins then, because I'm in this nice situation of having no sin uh, and, and uh, being guaranteed this bit over here. Um, and I did sin many, many times and do sin after my baptism, and so that happens on a regular basis. But whereas before this side was empty and needed to be filled with something and would be filled with my death... Now it is not empty. It is filled with the Lord Jesus Christ, death and resurrection. And so to balance it from here on in, if I confess my sin to God, he will cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and so he forgives my sin when I do sin. And you might say, well that's great, because I can now do loads of sin, and I'll keep getting forgiven as long as I ask for it. And that's exactly what we should not be trying to do. Because shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't do that. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And so you see, there is this wonderful solution to sin. And it is through love and logic, I put it to you. It is something that we can understand. And sin can be uh, forgiven uh, by the Lord God. And then we say, well, if sin is removed, what about this death bit? Does that mean that bit's going to be removed for us as well? And of course, that's exactly what it means. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so with our sins forgiven will we be. And it will be when the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven. And Mary, this time, not, not uh, Joseph, was told that the son, her son was going to be son of the highest and he was going to be a king because he was going to sit on the throne of his father David and rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there would be no end. You see, Christ actually means anointed. And so Jesus Christ means that he was going to be one day a great king. And we read about Jesus coming back in, in the scriptures all over the place. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So Jesus is going to come back. What does he do when he comes back? He raises his people. He raises uh, people from the dead. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we will be also in the likeness of his resurrection, guaranteed. Die with him and be raised with him symbolically, you will be literally raised uh, if you die before he returns. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. What does he do when he gets back? He will, uh, the dead in Christ will be raised first. Everyone which seeth the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. It's an incredible thing that is on offer to all men and women and yet how few understand that these are the things. Many that sleep in the dust of the earth will one day awake when Jesus Christ comes back. And so you see... Uh, dear friends, that by actually removing the initial problem, which was sin, we then remove this problem of death through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. 
Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we, by God's grace, be as well. And so you see this terrible sickness, this awful mess of the world, because what we're now just having a quick look at here is the fact that if, if sin's removed and death's removed, well, what about the curse of the earth? Is that going to be removed as well? Well, of course it is. It has to be. There's no question about it. The curse of the world has got to change as well. From this picture here to these pictures here. In the worldwide coming kingdom of God, nation will not lift up sword against nation, causing horrible pollution and killing loads of people. Neither will they learn war anymore, says Isaiah. Of the increase of the Lord Jesus Christ, government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David he will sit, and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice forevermore. It will be a righteous kingdom, not the corruption that we see uh, with our governments of the world today. There's, there will be no more drought, there will be food for all, because there will even be corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. Even the animals will be at peace with each other when the curse is lifted from this earth. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. And eventually, when the kingdom is fully established over all of the world and sin is entirely removed, there will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. Because the former things are passed away. The curse will finally have been lifted. And ultimately, the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God. That is where we're headed. And so you see, the thing is, when the Lord Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing the sickness and disease of the people, he was showing us in a physical way what he was going to do in the future. When his kingdom will come, he will remove all sickness and all disease. And you see, when Adam sinned, that is what happened. And God's response was to do that to the earth. He cursed the earth to make it balanced. That is what happened. He sinned and the earth was cursed. However, when the Lord Jesus Christ removes all sin from the earth, you cannot have that situation. The earth will be healed and become full of the glory of God and the balance will be recreated. And so you see, the only solution for a sick world is Jesus Christ. Jesus means saviour. He saves his people, those who follow him and who are baptised, from their sins. Which leads to a cure for spiritual sickness. Which leads to the forgiveness of your sins. And that was accomplished with his first coming. The word Christ, as we've said, means king. And he will save people when he returns as king from death. He will cure the physical ailments of this world. All sickness and disease and death will go. And the curse will finally be removed. And that will be achieved, dear friends, at his second coming. But when they believe, said, says this last verse in Acts here, when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. And I urge anybody here who isn't baptised to think about these wonderful things because that is the only way for us to remove our sin. And so it is, quite simply, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.